because we had already booked everything and my work schedule and blah 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 big long explanation that nobody really cares about but we're backtracking and we're going to Omaha Beach and um, so yeah it's gonna be a different vibe today I think a little more somber like um, when I was in Germany last I went to a concentration camp and it was just like really overwhelming um, but I also think that it's important to remember and, and kind of honor and appreciate the things that have happened in the world and the lives that were lost in order that our world could continue on in this direction instead of another direction um, and people kind of standing up for what they believed in and what they valued um, and ultimately sacrificing their lives. So it's a very difficult thing. Um, it's not like the most cheerful like, hey, this is going to be fun. But I do think it is enriching and, and purposeful and meaningful in the context of understanding our life and being thankful for what we have. Uh, it's, it's quite sobering um, to consider uh, what happened here and, and uh, what took place and why. Um, I feel like it's important to see. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to kind of pin, pin different emotions on it. Um, but I'm, I'm really thankful and, and I'm, and I'm proud and I'm also, um, mindfully aware of the sacrifice and, um, the, the pain, uh, and, and the, the sense of duty, you know, to, to right and to freedom. And so, uh, we're here, uh. And we're going to try to find words uh, to describe what we what we're seeing and what we're experiencing. Um, I I know very little compared to the experts on you know the world wars, especially World War II, especially D Day, and especially what happened in Normandy. But we'll try to give you some sense of idea of what it's like to come here, and um, we're going to experience it a little bit enough that we feel like we can emotionally you know handle as well and um, try to you know digest um, the important parts of history and um, uh, and hopefully you get something out of this uh, today if you decide you want to come uh, and visit yourself uh, you learn where to go what to do uh, in addition to um, connecting with us on our channel uh, through these kinds of experiences you know we like to do the really fun stuff we like to do the the ritzy stuff, the fantastic things, um, but we don't want to skip uh, the monumental history moments as well. Here we are at Overlord Museum. Uh, it's got tons and tons, like 9,000 five-star reviews on Google, and there are other museums. Uh, I'm sure there's other fantastic museums, but here's where we're going to start, uh, and so we'll give you a little taste of what's inside. Different stalls, informational stalls first, before we start to see some, um, some artifacts and some historic uh, um, pieces that happened in World War. Obviously, it's much about the story. Uh, they decided to start in 1919, which is the, the Treaty of Versailles, established after World War I, and uh, limited um, Germany's forces and, uh, and what they could do, from what I understand. And that was one of the first things that really kicked off uh, the problems uh, that we, we started to encounter in uh, the beginning of World War II, which was all the encroachments of the, the Treaty of Versailles. And so um, we're going to get to see a lot of original pictures. They were taking pictures back then, cameras were around. And so um, we do have pictures we'll get to see of even today, um, Normandy, and, and kind of compare the two. And so that's going to be really remarkable. 50 to 70 million people that died in World War II. The United States uh, entered the war um, in 1941 on December 7th in Pearl Harbor. And it wasn't for three more years that uh, on, well, two, two and a half years, on June 6th, June, June 5th and June 6th, uh, when D-Day happened, and that's really what marks uh, Normandy 
uh, for the war in a big way for the United States uh, entrance. Europe was, was under siege for several years, um, four years or so during World War II, before the U.S. was fully engaged. Um, and so uh, everyone was affected, including Africa, which is really surprising after watching some of the oversimplified uh, and other YouTube uh, series on it. It's very fascinating. In 1940, Dunkirk was when the first full invasion took all the coastlines and actually pushed the UK out um, through Dunkirk. And it's a really fascinating movie that's, that's fairly historically accurate from what I understand. The name of the museum is uh, Overlord and that was, from what I understand, the operation that was uh, was initiated on D-Day, Operation Overlord. So that's, that's why it's called that and that's what we're about ready to find out about. So I didn't know this, um, but it makes sense now. One of our one of our presidents soon after was one of the generals, Eisenhower, uh, in 1944. But right here we get to see the, the five the five main landings. Um, the first two, this is Utah Beach, and uh, here we have Omaha Beach, and the other the other three access points in terms of the United States came in here, along with Omaha Beach, and I believe this one was. Um, was uh, Canada um, and Australia, and then we've got the UK and, uh, and France and the Allied forces, the other beaches. We're gonna get to see a lot of these fortresses, these, these bunkers, and um, inside, you can see the different kinds of artillery that was used. I'm gonna look at this thing. That's, a, that's seven feet. The preparations for D-Day were, were phenomenal. I mean, even thinking about the types of uh, equipment were brought in across the, the, the pond, the, the Pacific. This right here was used uh, to to lay, lay down um, some type of material over barbed wire and other things so you could actually march troops in a, in a straight path. And there was a pipe that was actually laid from the United, United Kingdom over to um, uh, the Normandy region to supply the Allied forces with oil. It's really phenomenal. We also read that in order to accurately figure out where to invade and what the beaches look like and what to expect, the Allied forces uh, used like postcards and pictures that people had taken on their holidays to the beach in Normandy, which is like crazy to think about you know you went there on a vacation and then you're like oh, I got a picture of it so you can figure out what it looks like and where you should go and what to expect it's like you know you do everything you can and it's just incredible there were several operations that actually took place on D-Day and D-Day actually lasted until August 19th I guess um, which was you know battle Normandy as a whole from what I understand but I just wanted to read off a few because it was like so meticulously planned um, what was taking place on that day. I mean, you can imagine tens of thousands of people uh, under very specific orders to execute the mission at hand in order to win because if they didn't, it would be a completely different outcome potentially than what we see today. Um, it's 015. Pathfinders landed in Normandy instead of beacons. This is from the U.S. Airborne Landings uh, list. Um, Operation Albany took place on, at, at 1.30. 101st Airborne Paratroopers landed in Normandy at 2.30. Operation Boston took place where the 82nd Airborne Paratroopers landed in Normandy. At 400, Operation Chicago started with the 101st Airborne. Uh, 407, Operation Detroit initiated the 82nd Airborne Gliders. Uh, 2100 Operation Elmeria uh, delivered glider reinforcements in the Zone W. And so you've got different zones and you've got uh, so many things happening at once. Uh, can you imagine moving tens of thousands of troops and equipment and reinforcements into different areas strategically at a very specific time? It's just unbelievable, mind blowing, really truly mind blowing. The deception tactics are so fascinating and it kind of makes you even reflect on your own life and how people 
still use deception tactics every single day. There were um, strategically placed messages to make it sound like there were um, communications going that the Allied forces were going to do some things up near Norway. And so because of these planted communication messages, that was not their plan. They were not going to do that, but they kept the um, German forces convinced that it was gonna be more important to keep their troops there where there was no invasion happening versus coming to send reinforcements to France to prevent France from being taken over. So really amazing. They held them back for seven weeks with those kinds of tactics. They used captured soldiers to send messages. Um, it, it's just kind of phenomenal. Um, they also, I thought this was like so clever. I love the, the logic and the kind of outthinking um, your opponent piece because I think that is really what it is about at the end of the day. They, they sent uh, aluminum foil out of the planes and on radars to the Germans, this would look like um, someone was invading, right? It would look like machinery, materials made from aluminum. So they'd be picking that up on their radar and they'd be like, oh my gosh, what's going on over there? We gotta take care of that. It was aluminum foil. So this um, piece of equipment right here, there was 43,000 of these made and it's half uh, track and then half regular like Jeep. Uh, this vehicle, a uh, quite remarkable vehicle actually is water and land amphibian vehicle and it would carry about 20, 25 different troops but it would be a supply truck in addition to uh, you know coming in on the water and then literally just driving right up on the beach right behind me here this is the the sherman uh, named after one of the former general sherman uh, but uh, chrysler manufactured this uh, tank and it was manufactured in detroit and that was one of the, the main tanks, from what I understand, that the United States used um, on D-Day. And this is the competition here, the Panther uh, tank. Um, obviously, the Chrysler one looked better, had better curves, and more reliability. Actually, quite disturbing to me. It kind of makes my stomach turn. I don't know that I'll be hungry for lunch. I'm the kind of person that when I was nine and I realized, you know, where really understood where meat came from, I couldn't, couldn't ever see it the same way and went vegetarian. Um, death is really, yeah, it's, it's really sad to think of death that's caused at the hands of another person. Uh, for me, it's very, very difficult to understand, and I feel kind of betrayed by the fact that humans would kill. I don't know. I feel very um, confused and conflicted and distraught, I guess would be the right word. Um, that's just kind of how I've always been wired, and so it's like... Uh, like I, I'm very somber and I don't feel very well and it's very heavy um, for me, but at the same time, like, I feel like by doing this I can kind of honor, I guess, the people that were willing to die and sacrifice their life. It's not like I'm afraid of death for myself, but more so I just am saddened by the loss, the needless loss, and the needless pain. It's, it's a lot.
visit that he fought in D-Day. So taking pictures with monuments, taking pictures with the memorials, and uh, some of their family members as well. fascinated by the logistics and the system and the process um, just to you know the strategy that was involved really fascinated by the strategy and uh, obviously knowing how important it is um, different operations for them to be successful um, but I find myself you know in this museum there's so much but I was walking faster than Allie and um, you know, I could kind of feel my, my, my internal emotional tolerance was full seeing the faces of some of the people that fought in the war and then um, seeing them come back here to visit. Um, that's when it gives me chills and makes me want to cry. It's, um, you know, uh, lots of emotions. Final thoughts, um, I was reading the stories of the men and I just could not stop crying, so I figured it was best for me to move on. Um, very, very overwhelmed by emotions. Um, I feel very hurt and, um, yeah, just overwhelmed. I'm impressed and proud of the bravery of the people that um, I fought for what they believed in and made the world a different place. But I'm like, geez, it just feels like so much needless um, pain and, and fear and death and, and loss, you know? So um, I can't imagine being in that situation and what other people had to face in it sure as heck does make me think differently about how fortunate I am um, and how fortunate um, my family has been. I also don't understand how anyone can walk out of here and not be crying. Apparently it's just me. But I do, I'm amazed at the strength of all of these individuals. Just absolutely amazed. Inside they sold uh, bullets that were found in Normandy as a keychain. Thought about getting one, um, but not sure how well they're accepted through customs and stuff. Probably ship them home, but it's, it's yeah, a lot of a. Uh, emotions tied to picking up a bullet that was found in Normandy. Mm -hmm.